John and I are joined today by Sanjeev Gupta, who joins us from, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sanjeev, from the uh, West Coast USA, where it's morning for you now. I'm actually in New York, so yeah, ah, so <laughs> a little bit of a leeway there. Are you a bit closer and it's a bit less early? Thank yeah. you for joining us. Sanjeev is Chief Exec and Founder of Realization Technologies uh, and has run that company for over, over two decades, focusing on project management software. Uh, this is Sanjeev's second uh, software company that he's founded and set up, uh, both of them linked to Goldratt's theory of constraints, uh, operational management techniques. Uh, but we're here today to talk about the past uh, couple of decades of experience that Sanjeev's had. Normally our recorded interviews are just me, or me and John and our interviewee, so thank you very much for some of our colleagues and students who are able to join us on the call. Uh, feel free to make any comments, pass any comments, ask any questions, both as we go along, but also at the end. Uh, also, unlike many of our interviews, I've asked Sanjeev to prepare a bit of a structured presentation uh, for us for the first part of this input uh, to, to share his his developing thoughts and ideas about uh, project scheduling and project controls. But without stealing your thunder, Sanjeev, uh, I wonder if you could talk us quickly through your sort of journey, because it seems, or to me, it's quite rare for somebody who's set up a successful software company to now be almost giving away the, the, the family silver in that you're talking about generic methods for project scheduling and control, many of which can be used, either concepts that can be used without software or with other people's software as well as your own. And certainly in this presentation and discussion, we're not, we're not really talking about software, although you may touch upon it. Um, so what, what brings you the, today to talking about the underlying concepts of scheduling and managing project work? Um, Very good. Great question. Mm. Great question. I think I would answer the question, uh, give you three reasons for it. One is, I am personally horrified at the state of project delivery across the industry, across the world. Mm. So I think project management needs a serious leapfrogging. You know, it's, projects have kind of fallen behind all this curve of improvements that other industries and other like supply chain management, factory management, hospitals have followed. Project management is still stuck where it was about 60 years ago, if not has gotten worse. Mm. So the mission and realization we have is not to sell more software, is to help the world deliver its projects more on time. Right, so whatever helps us get better to that, closer to that mission is great, right? The second part is from a purely commercial perspective, you know, we are still very small compared to the large market that is out there. So, you know, if 85% of the people adopt this, techno this technique without our software and 15% use our software, that's still a big win for us. So, so that is, I think the second part, I think that there's a third part, which is I'm not too concerned about the competition getting in because what I've seen in the trend in the IT industry is people just run after something that is complex, the newest fad, where there is AI and machine learning today or mobile and web, you know, a decade ago or the enterprise software, you know, the whole client server technique technology before that. So the IT providers, they kind of, you know, they like stuff that is more complex. And hopefully what you will see after today's presentation is what I'm presenting is simplicity wins today. The simpler it is, I think, the more effective and the more powerful it can be. Excellent, great, uh, great running. So without much further ado, over to you, Sanjeev. You want to uh, take over to control of the screen and lead sure. us through the uh, the first that's bit exactly. of the session, please. Can you see my screen? Yep, that's great. Great. Okay, so I will start off by kind of what I mentioned to Ian in the opening 
answer is these are the statistics of just construction projects. On the left side, what I have is construction projects data from mainly around the US and Europe. And on the right side is just specific to India. So it doesn't matter where in the world you are, construction projects are late. And they're late by a lot. Right? And on both sides, what you will see is the performance is getting worse, not better. Right? So how can it be? How can that be the case? But before we go in there, it's not as if people don't know what is the benefit of doing construction projects faster. I think everyone who is in the construction business knows that if you can get projects done faster, then you have fewer assets, assets tied up for a short period of time. You know, whatever equipment you have, uh, cranes and other kinds of equipment. Um, your overheads are lower, right? Your uh, uh, cash to cash cycle is shorter and you get higher completion rate. So it's not as if people do not know what is the benefit of doing projects faster. And in fact, in the construction industry, I think the situation is a little bit more dire because if you look at construction, uh, what you will find is it's not a pyramid shaped industry in the sense that you don't have a few players at the top and then a lot of players in the middle and then a lot of more players at the bottom. It's more uh, like a funnel. At the top, you have large players, large EPC companies. In the middle, you have almost nothing. And then at the bottom, you have a lot of small contractors. And when I talk to these companies, every one of them struggles with cash. But the people at the top, the large EPCs, they can survive because uh, you know either they have uh, cash assistance or being provided to the banks or loans that they can get from the banks or from their parent company. But for the smaller subcontractors, contractors, the situation is pretty horrible. I mean, they live on, live and die by cash and they're always going hand to mouth in terms of cash. So the point being that the financial impact of faster delivery is obvious. And if you talk to, especially in India, if you talk to the prime minister of India or the person which is Mr. Narendra Modi or Mr. Gutkari, who is the uh, minister the union minister in charge of road, roads and highways, they know that India's economy depends on getting these projects done faster. They know that you know, India is spending five to 7% of its GDP on infrastructure projects. That's a lot of money, right? And there's a lot tied to it. So the benefit is obvious. So why are we still stuck in this 1960s era of bad performance in projects? And by the way, you know, before we think that is only construction industry, I think projects are horrible around the industries. You can pick up uh, reports from the aerospace and defense industry reports from the UK and the US, which do publish a lot of reports in terms of project performance by aerospace and defense companies. The situation is getting worse. In the pharma sector, the time to develop a new drug has increased. You know, a blockbuster drug. The last statistic I read was it used to take 10 years and now it takes 11 years, right? And of course, on the one hand, you can say that drug development is getting more uh, uh, complex. At the, on the other side, you also know that you have much more computer aided technology on the front end to shorten the development cycles. And so still it's taking longer to develop new drugs. And meanwhile, people are investing all this money in information technology. That still, we're not getting the results. So we are missing something. And hopefully by the end of this class, you might not agree with what I'm presenting, but at least you will get a new perspective on you know, what else can we do to improve the delivery of projects. So, so what I will talk first about, this is the agenda. What is the problem that I think we need to solve? And when I say I think is not, you know, is based on about 
400 different organizations that I have worked closely with and all kinds of projects you know, from small software development projects to building nuclear power plants, right? So the whole array of projects. Uh, so what is the problem that we are trying to solve versus the problem that we need to solve? So I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, then I will get into what is this flow-based scheduling solution that I'm presenting and then your questions and your feedback. And so we know why projects take longer. And you ask anyone what happened in your project, hey, the changes happened, delays happened, and then we did not get the resources we wanted, right? That is, we all know that. Now, the, you know, so this is an unreal world, the unreal world in which all the, all the project planning happens. This is the real world. In the real world, you have delays and changes and you have limited resources. The first thing I want to cover is that there's a lot of focus on these delays and changes. A lot of project management, research, consulting, information technology is all focused on dealing with delays and changes. So I'm gonna just walk us through a thought experiment to see if this really has as much of an impact as we think, or is the impact worse because of limited resources? And so I'll talk to that. But before that, I would you know, ask the people who are watching this masterclass to just you know, write down you know, what they think is the biggest impact on timelines, going from Q1 to Q2, or going from Q2 to Q4, or which, whichever, right? A, B, C, or D. Yeah, but what, what do you think? What do you think, Ian? Which one is the biggest uh, impact in terms of timelines? Hmm. Uh, whilst others type something in, I think, I think Q1 to Q2 has an impact, but then that's primarily because of what you just mentioned, that there's almost a mindset that delays and changes are problems. And, and if only we could make real world perfect, then things will be so much easier. And, and to me, that's like the mindset of uh, yeah. trying to design cars for smooth roads. Yeah. yeah, it would be much easier, but that's not the real life. So I, I suspect moving to Q3 is more challenging because it's not currently accepted as a as, as, as something that needs thinking about or even very difficult. Very good, okay. Yeah, yeah. thank you for Thank you for the lead. And John, do you wanted to add something? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I mean, my my experience in in projects, I mean, I, I've always thought that delays and changes are, are a natural event of doing projects in the real world. And what businesses are always blind to is that they have limited resources um, and they don't focus on what they really want they just try and do thousands of things at the same time which creates its own inefficiencies so i again would would push to the re the, the resources piece being the okay the, you know. very good so let's let's now validate that with this a thought experiment and see where we get thank you all right so this is your perfect world with unlimited resources which is it's a very simple project, not a real life project. So, because the real life project would be much more complex, many more tasks. Each circle represents a task. The name of the activity is B1, B2, B3, B4. B stands for blue color. So, which means these, these are blue colored activities performed by blue resources. Then you have two green activities and one purple activity. And so this is your perfect world. And in this world, if you look at it, the plan would be 28 days because the critical path would be over here and actual will be 28 days, right? So no surprise there, right? But if we live in this mindset of a perfect world, right? What is going to be our emphasis? Like, when do we have a good plan? The more detailed the plan we create, the better the plan is, right? So the, this is the mindset we are coming from. Let's, let's you know, let's, Assume the world is perfect and let's create a more and more detailed plan and God forbid we miss out something. 
right? Then our project will not be on time. So let's do a very accurate, precise estimating of everything that goes on in the project. Right? This is where we come from. Okay, you know, you do that, but then there's nothing to manage. You just plan the project and there would be nothing to manage. Right? You've done the plan, work will happen. But the reality is we know that whatever plan we create, the work does not happen as planned. And we've got to manage the project. That is why projects management is there. Otherwise, it would be just project planning. Right? Now, if we go, let's look at this. So in this case, you have changes and delays that have occurred. On the first activity, there was an input delay of three days. On the second activity, it took longer because the resources were unskilled and it, you know, it just took longer for them to do their work on B2. On B3, things happened. Actually, it got done in 10 days instead of 11, but you know, it was reported as 11 days. And B4, you had a, a task that was stuck and management took long to resolve that problem. So it took four days extra and same thing for G2. Right? So if we look at all these delays, in this case, you have three and four, seven and plus an eight plus 12 days of delay. But what is the net impact on the project? Only two days. Of course, our critical path, post facto critical path is different from where we thought it would be. But you know, this is the nature of projects. The delays, just because of the structure of project work, the delays don't add up. Actually, they cancel each other out. Right? So even with all these delays and changes, the project is late only by two days. But if you were to ask people of a project why they were late, they're going to point to these three days and four days and one day and four days. They're going to you know, find someone to blame. Right? But this is the reality. Right? Now let's look at what happens when resources are limited. And so you have four blue activities that need to be done in parallel but you have only two blue resources. Similarly, you have only one green resource for these two green activities. Let's look at that impact, right? And uh, I'll just pick up one possibility. Let's assume that we start, you know, we use a critical path method of allocating resources, which is we'll find the most critical path, allocate our resource to the first to the most critical path, then to the second most critical path and so on. So if you follow that logic, what you'll find is that the first blue resource will first work on B3 because that is the most critical part. Meanwhile, the second blue resource will work on B1 because that is the second most critical part. After they finish work on B3, the first blue resource will move on to the second blue activity and the second blue resource will move on to the fourth blue activity and the same logic on green. And what you find is my project took 41 days. Right. This is, again, taking that perfect world thinking of there's a project plan, there's a critical path, and let's use the critical path method to allocate resources. This is what you end up with. But there are 24 different possibilities here. And if I just map this range out, I'll see actually you could have done the project in 32 days, not 41 days. Right? And the worst case is 42 days here. So what is the point here? Just this limited resources that is causing a variation of 10 days in how long the project takes, right? And now let's imagine the real world where projects are not this simple. You have large projects, multiple teams with multiple supervisors making their resource allocation decisions. So where would we think that we end up with if you don't have one plan that is dictating who does what, but people are just making these resource allocation decisions on their own in their silos, right? What are the possibilities that you will end up with option two versus option three here? Right? You will most likely be with an option three. Right? And that is, I think, a significant point. Just by the way you allocate resources, you're 
in this simple example, you're talking about a difference of 10 days. Like 30 days versus 40 days. Let's now, before we kind of get trapped in the complexity, complexity world again, let's just remember that that all that optimization that I showed you is looks good on paper, but in trying to optimize your projects in detail, which people have tried, a lot of people have tried, right? You have specialized algorithms available for optimizing different types of projects, different heuristics, right? The problem is, first of all, it is a very tough problem mathematically to solve, right? So there is no way in the real world, you will know what the optimal answer is without hours and hours of crunching of numbers. On top of that, this assumes that you know everything about the project going in. You know what the tasks are, you know how long they will take, you know what the dependency between the tasks are. But in the real world, all these changes will happen. And, and we know we are dealing with kind of guesstimates here, not time in motion study as uh, uh, numbers for how long the tasks take. We're just dealing with estimates. And so that is why optimizing in detail or in, you know, is, a, is not the way to go. So I'm not at all wanting people to walk away from this class that the answer lies in some complex optimization routines that will tell you how long the project should take, that will tell you when to deploy your resources and you issue it to people and people will follow it. That will never work. So now let's look at when, what happens when delays and resource limitations are combined. And so in this case, again, you get uh, 24 different combinations. Again, there's a big variance, you know, it can go from, in this case, uh, from 38 days to 46 days, right? So, but again, the variance is huge, right? So how do we, what is the way to allocate resources, to plan and schedule your resources so that you end up with on the lower side of the variance, not the higher side of the variance, that is the challenge. Right, the overall point, I think, before we move into the solution side is this is where project management started, right? Critical path planning and unvalue management also kind of subscribes to that idea that once we have planned the work, we can track it using earned value management, et cetera. And, but in the re real world, we know changes and delay happen. So there is is where a lot of project management uh, how I would say improvements have focused, which is how do we minimize the changes and delays through better planning and then in, implement some kind of real-time monitoring system or even you know, some kind of risk analysis things which can help us quantify the risk. And if we cannot tell people exactly when the project will finish, at least we can give them a range, right? But what we are saying is this coordination problem of resources working on the right task at the right time is a bigger problem. In fact, uh, the Associated Schools of Construction, uh, there was a paper presented in their 2017 conference, which said that 25 to 50% of the time in projects is wasted in coordination. Like versus if you look at the various studies from many consulting companies, you will find that, that the external changes and delays they account for somewhere between 10 to 15% of a total project stack. Right, so the, I think there are two points here. One is these changes and delays are there. What are you gonna do about it? Yeah, you can minimize it, but if changes and delays account for 10 to 15% of your project timelines, how much can you reduce it by? Right, that is one thing to remember versus if you have this coordination losses, and if you can find a solution to solve this problem, how much of it can you take away? Right, so the leverage is here. 
It's not just the magnitude is higher, but the leverage is also higher. There's a second point here. To implement very good project planning, very tight management, you know, where everyone is aware of the changes that are taking place. And every time you are going back to the customer and pushing back against the changes, et cetera, right? How long will that, even if you were able to implement those kind of solutions, how long will it take to implement those solutions? And right? you have to implement those changes en masse. It's an en masse change versus if you solve the coordination problem, it's, a, it's not a cultural change thing. And you can implement it much more swiftly. Hopefully you will see that after I uh, walk through the flow-based scheduling solution. But coordination problem is as simple as this. On the one side, you have work waiting for resources. On the other side, you have resources waiting for work, right? So this is my simple pictorial representation of a coordination problem. And if you don't think you have a coordination problem in your organization, in your projects, think about these questions. One is how many times you have a situation where resources have more than one or two or three tasks in front of them in their queue. Right, so if they have multiple things in the queue, you have a coordination problem. How many times does it happen that resources are waiting for work, but also in parallel, work is waiting for resources? So in the sense that resources are busy somewhere else, but these resources that are waiting for work, they're waiting on someone else to finish their work before it comes to them, right? So if you have that situation, you have a coordination problem. How many times does it happen that you have bow waves of work? So sometimes the same resources are idle and sometimes the same resources get overloaded all of a sudden. If you have that, then you have a coordination problem. So this is what we have to solve for. Right? In terms of the solution, this is what we have to solve for. How do you allocate the limited resources and prioritize the work? with a complexity that in the real world, projects are not deterministic. There are lots of changes that happen. You cannot plan everything in a lot of detail. And the objective being minimize the coordination losses. And this can be within a project or across projects. On top of that, one more thing I would add is, it's not just the resources that do direct work, right? So people who pick up these tasks and do the work on those tasks. In projects, a significant set of resources are these problem solvers who don't directly touch a task, but they are the people who solve problems. Whether they are managers, they solve problems by their decisions, expediting decisions, experts who go and solve the technical problems where tasks get stuck or who find innovative ways to recover the schedule or coordinators who are changing with customers or suppliers to get the stuff delivered on time or to bring the approvals in on time. So we are talking about these resources as well, not just the resources that work on the task. Right, and the choice in my mind for the industry at large is pretty simple. You know, and Ian, you kind of referred to it in the beginning, which is the thinking today is that projects would be on time if it were not for delays and changes. Therefore, if we want projects to be on time, we need to create a world where projects happen exactly as planned. And this is, I don't know if there is a logical fallacy category for this, but I would call it the wishful thinking fallacy. Right? You're saying, you know, the world is bad because there are evil people in the world, so let's create a world where there are no evil people. <laughs> that is not going to happen. So that is why I think we want to explore a new direction. And let's go quickly into that new direction, which is the flow-based scheduling solution. So first of all, we need a fresh approach, right? I just want to keep emphasizing that part that in this Q4, if I were to ask a question, right? In this quadrant four, which is the real world, what would happen if we plan the projects in excruciating detail? Would it be just useless or would it be counterproductive? 
you know people can just think a little bit about it and answer similarly what happens if we optimize in detail is it just useless or it is counterproductive what happens if we react to every delay is it just useless or is counterproductive I just think about it. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because in the perfect world scenario or in this quadrant two or quadrant three, that this is our instinct to do these things. But in the real world of projects, all these things are counterproductive. In fact, I think for your uh, students uh, in this class, it might be a good idea. So let me look at the chat, what people have responded. Counterproductive, 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 counterproductive. Okay, right. So I think it'll be a good exercise for the students to just write like a few bullet points as to, you know, why is it useless, why it is counterproductive. Just think about it. Now, let's, in terms of searching for a solution, in the scenario where you have limited resources but no delays and changes, right? Do we see any pattern here? Like which option, so obviously option two and option six seem to be the two best options out of these six. In fact, out of the 24, these are the two best options. Right. Just think a little bit about what is the difference between option two and option one in terms of how we are allocating resources. Just think about it for a minute and I'll move to the next slide. Same thing here. Let's look at you know option two and option six. Even after the delays and changes, that seems to be the best option. What is the pattern here? Why is option two and option six? Why are they coming out to be better than the other options? And I just want to kind of issue a, a caveat. We are dealing with an NP complete problem here, right? So, uh, and now it's an optimization problem that is impossible to solve. So there is no heuristic that will give you the, always the optimal answer. The best we can do is we can come to a, solution space you know which is kind of the better solution space than the rest and then people still have to exercise their judgment so in this case for example you know during planning you might think option two is the best but in during execution for whatever reason option six might turn out to be the best so people's judgment etc will be involved but still the pattern hopefully i that you can see is that in these two options, options two and six, we are concentrating resources around one green activity. Instead of scattering our resources across these two green activities, across the top and the bottom. So we took our, both our blue resources, we put them here. Before that, we took both our blue resources, we put them here. In this scenario, we took one of our blue resources put them on the most critical path and a second blue resource on the second most critical path, which happened to be a different, uh, serving a different green activity. And the green activity here is kind of significant. What we are really saying is if you have limited resources, concentrate your limited resources around as few integration points. And what we mean by integration points is points where different activities come together, they need to be integrated before you can move on. Right, so some integration points in the projects are obvious. You have final system installation and testing, that is an integration point. You have subsystem level integration and testing, that is also an integration point, right? So if you are dealing with multiple projects, then you better focus your resources on a fewest number of projects at a time and you will get done faster. If you're dealing with a large complex project with multiple subsystems, 
then you better focus your resources on the most critical subsystems first, and then the next set of subsystems, right? And what is the rationale? Rationale is, I think, pretty obvious, right? Projects are nothing but a series of integration points. That is all you're doing. As you're completing the project, you are relieving more and more of these integration points. So if you can get to these integration points faster, the faster the project will finish. Think of it from a different angle. Where is the coordination problem the worst? Is it the worst or the blue activity or the green activity or the purple activity? So what you will find is wherever more and more integrations need to happen, more and more works still need to be integrated, that is where the coordination problems start getting worse. And this golden rule will also minimize the impact of delays. One more side benefit, important side benefit. If I think about resource allocation this way, do I worry about how good the estimates are for the individual blue circles? My decision is not going to change. But I'm still going to focus my resources like this. So I don't, my, what that means is my planning needs to be good enough only at the box level, not at the circle level. And that is huge in projects. That is huge. To give you an example, and hopefully we'll have time to show you, at the circle level, a construction of a power plant is about 100,000 tasks. At this box level, construction of a power plant is about 1,000 tasks. A simple road project, you know, you're building a stretch of like 30, 40 kilometers of a road or a highway. At the circle level, it's about 300 tasks. At the box level, it's about 10 to 12 tasks. That's what this is the magnitude of simplification you are bringing. You know, almost a factor of uh, 100, you know, 10 to 100. And that is huge. That is really huge. The other thing it does is thinking about it at the box level, right? I Do I worry about how the supervisor is allocating resources within a box? Or do I leave the decisions to them? Hey, you know, I really, you are on the ground. You are the person making the decisions. You know what is happening. So you go and make those decisions. At the planning level, I'm going to make a decision only at the box level. Okay. Let's talk about a little bit more of our integration points. So these are some of the non-obvious integration points in projects, which is you have interactive work. So when you are doing system design, for example, you know, you are building, let's say a satellite and you're doing engineering of a satellite. So you have mechanical engineers and thermal engineers. Their tasks are kind of independent, but they need to share information with each other, right? So we don't want the mechanical engineering person to be working on one part of the satellite and the thermal engineer to be working on a different part of the satellite. We want them to be working together. And so that is also kind of an integration point where you would draw a box around these activities and say, I need to allocate resources to this box, not to the individual circles. And so that's an integration point. Another integration point is from a practical perspective, which is especially in construction projects, you have different contractors that come in and perform different trades. And so a different contractor would be responsible for civil, maybe a different contractor is responsible for installation. So you don't want the contractors to get stuck because someone else did not finish their work. So you want to force a policy of this clear work front. And this is an established best practice, which kind of is difficult to achieve. But again, what we are saying is all the three blue activities need to be done before you can pass it on to the green guys. And that is also an example of an integration point. Um, before I move further, because I'm going to now uh, look at the advantage of this focus and finish idea in a larger context, any questions or comments so far that I need to address? 
I don't think so, Sanji. There's a couple of comments, uh, Christo and Kelly, in effect, uh, reinforcing some of the comments you make from both their experience and wider research. But, yeah, uh, very good. Otherwise, that nothing, uh, n n nothing to sort of uh, delay or clarify before you move on yet. Okay. Okay, and, and from your side also, John, anything that you think I need to I, I go just back have and... One... One question. Um, I know it's a very simple model, but 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 what if you model them? What are the ramifications of picking the wrong integration point to focus on? Because those those integration points are fairly close. One's you know the longest path is eleven days, and the other one I think is nine or something. Yeah. So so are you going to touch upon that? You know whether actually yeah. it matters really because if you get eighty percent of them right then you still get all the benefit pretty yeah. much yeah very good so that's a great question john so i think there are two two points there right one is you can be right only so much as reality would allow you to be because you are you know you in planning you might assume 11 and 9 in reality it might turn out to be 12 and 14 right so you cannot be more right than the reality would allow you to be. That is one. And the second thing, what we have observed from experience is, once we simplify the plan to the level of, uh, you know, from 100,000 to 1,000, and then you will see the next slide, that furthermore, the resource allocation decisions don't need to be made even for those 1,000 points. They need to be made at a, for a much fewer set of points. So I will address that part. And then, point I'm getting to is that, you know, our reasonable human being will make good decisions. And, you know, when we look at that picture, that the simplified picture that will come up now. So let's go to something where you have different phases of work, right? So let's take, for example, a water project where you are linking rivers through a set of pipes and tanks, right? So you have one river which has an overflow of water, another set river that has less water, and you want to prevent the flooding in one area and the drought in the other area. So you decide to link the rivers, right? So you a lot of that work is, for example, laying the pipes, building the tanks, etc. So imagine that is your first phase. Then you put in the valves, etc., to control the water system, and then the final integration and approval of the project. And you're doing it in three different zones. Right, so you got zone one, zone two, zone three. Same kind of work, just for simplicity's sake. And if I could get three people, I could finish the work stream first, work stream in five weeks. If I get another three people, I can do second work stream in parallel. So if I get nine people, I can do all the three work stream in parallel. And this is the setup. Same thing here. I have seven weeks of work. If I get three people uh, on the one work stream, I can get done in seven weeks. If I get six people, I can do two work streams. If I get nine people, I can do three work streams and so on. Right then now, let's see what happens if you have limited capacity. Again, I'm choosing a very simple example, which is you have enough resources only for one of them. Right, so first of all, going back in the real world, if as a manager, if I'm the supervisor of this blue resources and I know my capacity is limited, I know on all these work streams, there will be delays downstream, right? And the moment I find my resources idle, what am I going to do? Am I going to say, just stay put, or I'm going to say, you know what? My resources are limited, so you better go and finish up some work here. Moreover, let's get a head start so that if there are any delays or changes downstream, we will have time to recover. Right? So how, where would, what would be the instinct of managers, supervisors, planners to spread resources across? Yeah, keep people busy. Keep people busy, right? Yeah. And in fact, people will say, you know what, we can also do some overlapping, you know, we can, before the entire blue phase is finished, we will start the green phase. Right? That is how we will get the project done faster. This is how we will crash the schedules. 
do more things in parallel, do more overlapping, and that is how the project gets done faster. So in this particular scenario, what I end up with is, instead of five weeks, plus five weeks, plus five weeks, which is 15 weeks, I end up with 12 weeks. So I did get more efficient, ostensibly. Similarly, instead of uh, seven weeks, plus seven weeks, plus seven weeks, I ended up with 18 weeks. And so instead of four plus four plus four, I ended up with 10 weeks. And with some overlap, I got the project done in 37 and a half weeks. Now let's apply the golden rule and see where it leads us. So again, the golden rule is finish one box before you start another box. So this is what we end up with. We'll finish this box before we move our resources, blue resources to the second box and the third box. And we'll finish this box before we start the green box. And we'll finish the green box before we start the purple box. Right? What do you end up with? You end up with five weeks plus seven weeks, seven weeks, seven weeks, four weeks, 30 weeks. Like you magically ended up with a shorter schedule, not just at the box level, but at the overall sub project level. And the, it's not magic, right? Because we know why it happened. Because in this case, you are waiting for a long time before you can start the green activities. Over here, the green guys are getting their work started much earlier. But let's look at the other implications of this. In this scenario, where is the critical part? Everywhere. Everything is critical. In this scenario, where is the critical path? There is one critical path. In this scenario, what happens if there is a small delay or a change to this nicely laid out plan? Let's say there was a small delay on this dot. It would affect the schedules everywhere, right? This delay would mean this, it delays this, it delays this. Over here, you have a natural buffer that emerges. Which means this blue activity can be delayed. This blue activity can be delayed. There's still a buffer. There's still a buffer here. The purple activity can be delayed. There is still a buffer here before it impacts the project. Right? And where does the buffer come from? It's very simple, actually. Over here, all this time between the activities is split. It's kind of lost. Right over here, all of that gets consolidated in the form of a buffer. Because over here, we have minimized the waiting times, the coordination losses within the box. And so that is how we have gotten more of a buffer. And, and all these are the uh, you know, questions for people to ponder. But you know, really, this is, this is all we are saying. Now to come back to your question, John, I th even though I have nine boxes here, I have to make only one decision, which is which work stream gets started first, which work can get started second, which is the third one. Right, so this is kind of going back to this example of 100,000 down to 1,000, right? And in reality, it comes down to about 50. You know, managers have to just sequence about 50 different critical work streams in that massive four or five year project. The only, that's the only decision the managers have to make because once you have made that decision and implemented this focus and finish rule all across the board, you don't have to worry about anything else. So that is the only decision you are making. And I would not have a software make that decision because managers know something that the software will never know. Managers know the inherent risk, for example, in one particular work stream versus another work stream. Managers might also have an idea about, hey, is there a cash payment tied to this work stream or to this work stream? Where do I get more cash? Managers might also know where are the supply chain constraints, right? So there are things that managers know that the software will never know. So I would just leave this decision to the managers and I would not sweat too much on how good their decision was because the reality the reality will 
change in a four year project. What you thought was the first work stream might end up being the third work stream in actual execution. So does that kind of answer your question, John? Yeah, it does. And, and, and you know, I, I guess with all these things that the most important thing is the, is the idea of focus and finish. And it, as I said, if you, if you, in the end, get 80% of your guesses right or more, then actually that's fine and, and it'll work. And the problem is when you all the time are pushing for 100% accuracy and then everything gets lost yeah. in, in that pursuit. Yeah. 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 And this mode actually allows you to live with 80% data accuracy. Over here, if you want a very good plan, you need to strive for that data accuracy. And, and presumably, Sanjeev, and hopefully you'll come across it. Uh, that 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 decision then was the scheduling decision. What once you get into execution, and you're looking to make day-to-day -day management decisions based on how reality unfolds in front of you, uh, presumably there are a different set of decisions that need to be made. Um, there are. There are, but the guiding rule is always focus and finish. So let's just take this example. Yeah. Let's say that instead of two work streams, we had scheduled you know, one work stream in par uh, at a time. We had enough resources to do two of them in the time of planning. At the time of planning, mm -hmm. we thought that we could do two work streams in parallel. Right? But you get into execution and you suddenly find that these pipeline resources you know, the contractor did not mobilize enough resources. So they mobilized only half the resources you thought. Right, so what, what is going to change? So still the only thing that is changing is whether you do work stream one or work stream two first. But the fact that you have to focus and finish is still the golden rule. Right, or let's say that we get further down into execution and we find that, hey, we need some purple resources for this green box also, for some reason, right? So because project work is complex. You know, when you are doing uh, pipeline, you might need some inspector to come in or some engineer to come in and help you. So, or let's say you have a technical expert who could put their time in the purple box or the green box, right? Still, the guiding rule is focused and finished. The only thing that will change is whether this purple box comes first or the green box comes first. Right? And in this case, the what I would do is I would simply look at, hey, this purple box, how much of the buffer has it got left in front of it? Versus on the critical path, you know, if there is a buffer here or the critical path is moving at a faster rate, the planned critical path. So wherever the buffer is the least, that is where I would put my resources. But still the part that I'm going to enforce is focus and finish. And this is, I think the point that you were making Ian, or the, when we were having the discussion in the beginning, I think this focus and finish idea is the primary thing. And it doesn't matter what software you use. There was a case study I'm sure you remember we presented in about five or six years ago, there was this uh, lands landscaper I had. He had done three houses for me. This was his third house. So his name is Baltasar. So I sat him down. I said, Baltasar, you know, because my project was getting delayed. I said, Baltasar, let me teach you how to do a better scheduling. He goes, nah, 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 scheduling doesn't work. I'm like, okay, Baltasar, do you want to make more money? Because of course I want to make more money. So I showed him this focus and finish idea. <clears throat> he went from about a $250,000 turnover to $5 million a year turnover. He reduced the number of people he had in payroll from about 45 to about 20 people. And he reduced the number of parallel projects, landscaping projects he was doing. He reduced it from like seven or eight to two. And he got more work done, more revenues, customers are happier because now the landscaping projects are getting done in like 
uh, 15 days, 20, uh, three weeks instead of taking six months to do. Yeah. Right? So he was able to do that without any software, you know, just the idea. Once he got this idea of focus and finish, his project was simple enough that he could conceptualize this thing on a piece of paper and allocate his resources. Yeah, and I can I can vouch for the case study in that I've uh, I've met Balthazar. I think it was in the Las Vegas concert uh, conference, wasn't it, Sanji? You 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 brought yes. him along, and yes. uh, and he said yes, he got this guidance, no software. He made those behavioural changes, and uh, it, hey presto! I think I think he said uh, he started to be able to pick his kids up from school, which he'd not done for years. <laughs> he? Yes, yes. And, you know, I'll just take the example to a larger context. So in India, you have a massively constrained supply chain for the construction industry. Right, so now you have all these road projects going on. And the way the road projects are done is, you know, they have a zone, within the zone, they have different roads, and within the road, they have different stretches. Right? But there's no focus and finish over there. So what you have is a lot of partially finished segments all around. And, and if you just focus and finish, you would get all of them done. And so the, I think the point I'm making is that once you organize this way, you also relieve your supply chain. Over here, your supply chain is stretched thin to people who are supplying stuff. Over here, the supply chain you know, they have to do this first and then this first and then this, the second and the third, right? So it has an impact, not just on the work that you do. It has an impact on your suppliers also. Yeah, and if you, I, I can see one of the differences to a contractor having worked in construction. If, if working the three in parallel allows them to get stage payments, uh, invoiced and allows them to get a cash lead then their reward and motivation will be to work in the top way to, yes to, to pull forward tasks that allow them to invoice it, Great. Is, that, Great. is that something you need to mitigate when you're looking to implement this focus and finish approach because uh, the number of 90 percent complete tasks is uh is is a huge crazy. yeah so uh sort of you want to shed some light on it from your actual experience? Uh, <clears throat> two, three things. One is that uh, I'm not sure which precedes what, in the sense that the contracts precede the plan or some sort of plan precedes the contract. So if traditionally people are thinking of the top picture in planning, then the contracts would probably also try to follow that. So uh, that, that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, a lot of companies are realizing this and they are trying to put it in their contracts anyway. I mean, they are realizing that a lot of unfinished work doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So the road project Sanjeev was mentioning, there there is uh, incentive for completion up to 50%, up to 90% and so on. Uh, and in uh, transmission line projects, uh, there are penalties for actually dumping too much material on the ground. You have to, you can only bring as much material that you're going to erect in the next three months. So they are trying to drive completion uh, through payments, uh, but still, still the problem exists. Yeah. In spite of that. So what you are saying sort of is that from your, what you observe on the ground, people are moving away from progress payments to completion oriented payments already. Yes, so the there is some part associated to progress payments. So yeah. typically how it is made is 80% is on progress payment. Yeah. The remaining 20% you get when you reach milestones of completion. And yeah. if you can- And the, second, them, point, and the second point I think you are making is also significant. Uh, Ian, I think what we are saying is that once you build this kind of a plan, and you know normally we encourage you do that collaboratively with your major contractors, once you build this plan, it tells you what your contracting strategy would be. Yeah. Right? So it's not that difficult of a change. People, you know, because everyone is benefiting here. Everyone is getting their cash faster. 
right? But if you started the plan this way, and then if you contract on the basis of this plan, then you will end up with the scenario you're talking about. But if you build this plan and then started doing the contracting, you will end up in a different place. And, and for me, it would seem simpler uh, in, the, in, in the top plan, although there's a fixed price for the, the three month blue activity, measuring how much has really been done each month, which is certainly the convention in the uh, in the UK and UK based uh, contracts, it is quite a technical, difficult, argumentative job. So there's a fixed price for the whole lot, but measuring what's justified each month is very complex. It's very complex. If, yes, if yes. that's if that shifted to the equivalent of sort of five week milestones, and each one is measured, have you done all that work? It's actually a simpler thing to measure Thank whether you. the last piece is in Great place. observation. Yeah. Great observation. Great observation. So, and what you said about the UK industry, I know from my experience in India is the same. You have this daily progress reporting, right? And you have to submit this daily progress reports and someone has got to compile all those progress reports to determine how much you get paid. Yeah. And then there is all these arguments about whether the work was really done or not, right? Moreover, there are always the conflicts between, hey, but you did not do the important work, you did the unimportant work. But the plan never specified what is important and what is not important. Exactly. As, as, as and, Sumaf said, to, to overcome the problems, the thing gets more complicated and more complicated is added to it rather than yeah. simplifying it. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so one thing that I've... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, in contracts, one practice is to use dates a lot. Start date is mentioned, date of completion is mentioned, etc. That puts a lot of pressure on people to start. Uh, not cycle times, not duration. That the day you get handover, you have to finish it in the next 180 days. Instead of that, people put dates. So if the handover happens late, then the person is under pressure to start early. So that is also, I, I feel that is one of the reasons uh, in contracts, what forces people to start early, even though they're not ready. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that, that's linked to a point I was gonna make as well about what I would call kitting, which is this also lends itself to making sure that you have everything there in order to do the, the, the packets of yeah. work. And you don't start them unless you have. I guess that's the other side of this, as well as focus and finish. It's don't start until you're ready to start. Um, and yeah. and you know, a lot of work yeah. is dragged out because people start too early and then they haven't got what they need, whether it be resource, you know, people resources or material resources or tools or cranes or whatever, yeah. and then that drags. The work out and you here you could insert that discipline as well that you don't start the work until everything's ready to go yeah yeah there's one more thing ian in terms of the simplicity right so a lot of times what you will have is even if you don't have this daily progress reporting etc you still have a requirement from the epc contractor or the general contractor to get detailed schedules from their subcontractors and someone in the head office is spending literally 15 days of a month integrating all those schedules into one plan, right? Giving a picture to the top management. By the time the picture goes to the top management, the next month has already started and the picture you are getting is false anyway, right? Over here, you don't need those. <laughs> I don't care about what details you have, literally. And over here, I don't need to care about all the details because I need to put it all together and see what the impact on my project is. So, Sanju, just, you know, when, whenever this is talked about, um, it all makes complete sense. Um, <coughs> it's logical and understandable, and yet it's it's not done so so widely. What, what do you think the, stands in the way of people? Yeah. That's a People great question too. Yeah. So I do not know the answer to it, but I would say at least 80 to 90% of the blame is with us. You know, 
us as in who are providing this thought, this idea, because we have never, you know, we kind of knew this was the answer, but we never verbalized the detailed logic behind it, right? Partly because we ourselves were learning, partly because we did not think about the importance of verbalizing, but now at least we are rectifying that mistake mm -hmm. to say, okay, this is the exact logic. So I think 80 to 90% of the blame is on us that we never verbalized this, what we are doing right now. I think the more we can get this idea out, I think people will start following it. That is my hope at least. And if not that, then we'll find out the next obstacle and overcome it. But you know, we are going to reform the construction industry, the projects work. Okay, so there are some questions in the chat. So one is from Tawanda. Yeah, and that, that, that popped up much earlier on. Um... Okay. I think just as you just as you were getting into this, comparing, I think the uh, the, the the simple six scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go back and see if I, you know, if that question has not been answered, we'll address it in a minute. Uh, after, let me finish these slides. Right. So these are just the questions for people to ponder. That like what is the impact of changes and delays? Versus in mode A. What is the impact of those changes and delays? Right over here, really not much of an impact. You just go and update the dots and keep moving along the strategy that you have defined. And we, I already asked this question, where do buffers come from? You know, they come from consolidating the waiting time. Basically, that is where the buffers are coming from. Right, in response to a, a question from you, Ian, you know, we talked about how to use these buffers to manage resources. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also important. Like in project, so we talk a lot about project controls, right? But what is the real meaning of control, right? When we say we are controlling a system, what we mean is we are able to measure how the system is behaving and modify something so that it behaves in the right manner, right? But in mode A, when everything is critical, you kind of don't know where things are going wrong. Everything is a fire. You're fighting fires everywhere. Versus over here, you get a very predictable signal. You know, if anything is delayed on the one stable critical part, the project will be delayed. You know, if buffers are getting eaten up too fast, your project will be delayed. Not only that, you also know where to go and focus your effort for scheduled recovery. Right, so that is also an advantage that comes out. Again, all we did was we did focus and finish. So there are people who are familiar with the theory of constraints, critical chain project management. And right? so they talk about staggering and buffers, right? But no one specifies how to go and get that stagger and how to do get those buffers. And what we have discovered, John, in answer to an earlier question, is that by doing this focus and finish, your buffers naturally come out. By doing this focus and finish, the stagger automatically happens. Last year. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I mean, I think the only point I would again emphasize towards the end is that resource allocation is a much bigger problem than people think it is. The impact of allocating resources to the right task at the right time is much bigger in terms of the timelines for the projects and as a result, the financial impact on projects. So this is one point. The second point is, in theory, the resource allocation problem is a very complex, tough problem to solve, even if the world were static. In the real world where changes are happening all the time, is even more difficult. But if we step back, we can find a simplifying rule to manage our resources better. And that is what I've tried to highlight through this flow-based scheduling idea, which is the golden rule being focus and finish. Mm -hmm. You focus and finish your, you focus your resources around integration points, finish that work before you move your resources to something else. 
you will get a faster flow all across the board. And that's kind of uh, the summary of the lesson, if you will. Thank, th thank you for that, Sanjeev. Uh, I've I've got a question, um, and you you were highlighting that sort of managing project work. You looked at two distinctive uh, perspectives or levels: the overall project itself, yeah, and, and the the, the so-called box activities or tier one, and within the work packages where you've got your tier two or your your circle activities. Uh, and are you suggesting that each warrants a different approach to to management? Because I think the one of the conventions is it's a good idea to lump everything together, isn't it? As, uh, as Sir Ab has shown. Uh, yeah. How distinctive do you see those activities of managing work within within a particular work package or, yeah. or one of your boxes? Great. I think another great question. Another great question. So. First of all, I think people want those boxes and dots in one plan, for sure, right? Because you're not going to have one plan of 1,000 boxes and a separate plan for each box in a separate place, right? So it makes sense to put them in one plan. But the two are different in the sense that the resource allocation, you know, of limited resources that we are doing, is really at the box level, at the circle level. We are just assigning people on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I've got 10 people in my crew. I decided to put the entire crew on zone one of pipe laying. Now within that zone one, you know, where does Tom work and where does Dick work and where does Harry work and where does Sora work or Sanjeev work? That is decided by the supervisor. And you know, most of the time we are saying supervisor will make a good decision there. But, you know, once you have uh, implemented this focus and finish idea, you can glean out best practices, even for the dot level and share them across the organization. So I remember in the US Air Force, you know, one of the implementations we did, so the assembly of the gear box was like a 15 day task almost. And, you know, we found that one of the supervisors was getting it done in like six days. So we found out what is the sequence he was following at the dot level. And we published that, that sequence as a best practice to all the supervisors and everyone started doing it that way. So you, you, you facilitate a sharing rather than built it into the schedule. Because as, yes. as we know, putting all the tasks in a big schedule doesn't mean that's what the supervisors and work package managers use. That's what the plan is. Yeah. Yeah, but the only thing I would add as a but is that once we define this box level plan, and if really there is a sequence that can be followed at the dot level, then people will follow it, right? So in the software, you can capture the sequence of the dots if that sequence is available to you. And people will be able to follow that sequence because now you're not, you know, they are getting the resources they want. Versus in this scenario, you cannot follow the dot level plan. Yeah. And I suppose one difference in control, uh, and maybe you've got a comment on it, is that uh, the, the common convention is control is following a baseline and anything that varies from it is a bad thing. And, 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 and the commitment, the accountability of people is for following a baseline. Okay. I think you're saying that they, they're there's still accountability, but it's different. It's it's about working in a particular way. Is that is that a reasonable summary, or is there something else that? No, no. I think that's a great summary. Yeah. And at the same time, I would say it is not either or. It is both. Mm. Right. What we are saying is, the most important control to exert is focus and finish. If you are not doing focus and finish, don't worry about the rest because the problems are coming from not doing focus and finish. Mm -hmm. But if you find that focus and finish is happening, then of course you want to measure against the baseline to see if your project will be on time or not okay. in terms of the projections. And you need to then figure out where to take corrective actions and recover the schedule. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, just Another thing I would like to add, Sanjeev here. Uh, am I audible? 
Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so when the when there were unlimited resources, the network had only one answer. So inside the box, if the resources are really loaded, then it's very difficult for the, the the choice of allocation does not really change the answer in that case. Most mostly, I mean, there would be still a critical path inside, etc. But if you have enough resources, the supervisor would probably put the resource on any board that is available. So naturally, it takes a lot less time to get it done when that is really followed. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, sir. In, in in the construction and capital project markets, how how does the approach that you're talking about the flow based scheduling, Sandeep, how, how mm -hmm. does that sort of sit alongside other initiatives in the construction sector, like? last planner or advanced work packaging Very good. which which to some extent are addressing similar issues but in a correct. different way in a different way correct so i think kelly can probably you know coming from he's actually working in construction projects so he can shed more light but i'll add my two cents and then if kelly wants to add something he can right so what i would say is observation you made ian is correct right. You know, people are trying to solve this scheduling problem intuitively or by knowing that, you know, there's some issue here, but they're trying to solve this problem in mode A, which makes it utterly unsolvable. Like over here, you cannot do last, last uh, mile planner because that is just too, you know, things are changing too much. Your critical path is moving all, all over the place. You're having to manage too much. Over here, you can do it, and you have to do it for fewer things at a time. Right? Same thing with everything else that you're trying to do from a planning and scheduling perspective. In my mind, going from here to here just makes all those things that you have been trying to do possible. And let's just talk, take one more example of talking about late delivery penalties and early completion incentives. In this mode, you never have any late delivery penalties that are enforceable because everyone can blame something someone else. Hey, why did this milestone not happen on time? Because there was some delay over here. That everyone can point fingers at someone else. Over here, you actually know why the project is getting delayed. And uh, Kelly, do you want to add anything? I, I think you covered the points that I, I would <clears throat> I would stress in um, construction large cap commercial construction, uh, the resources related more to um, commodity uh, and uh, initial flows of that ba commodity based work um, and regional competition for the same, you know, commodity capacity, co concrete, or steel or um, those kind of things. Um, create okay. constraints that naturally, you know, force us uh, to optimize to those flows, but we're all, we're typically uh, trying, attempting to put it into a uh, traditional critical path, which yeah. um, results in, you know, high level of detailed tasks to, to, to try and um, mitigate um, the shortages or the, or the delays. Uh, and, and it ends up being somewhat chaotic for management okay yeah thank you anything else ian uh just just one uh and no doubt some of your colleagues might be able to give an insight here back back to the sort of large construction capex type project um where where project logistics tends to concern yeah, materials and goods and equipment arriving on site and, and very often that falls outside the, the conventional remit of even critical path scheduling and primavera in the yeah. sort of, you know, customized steel and sub assemblies that need to flow to the site, but can't always be installed exactly where you want them. So sort of where to put them. The, and those flows have probably got more in common with supermarkets and distributors than they do conventional projects. So right. how, how, how might you see large projects 
managing those secondary flows of goods and materials and and yeah. is that independent or does it sort of synchronize with what you've been talking about because a, That's a, great a coordination question. problem is a problem is there also no no actually what you're talking about is secondary flows in a lot of so we are doing for example you know a steel plant construction a steel factory in india mm. so those are the major flows right managing that whole logistics of material movement and material storage is important in the construction industry there is a lot of you know i, I don't know the exact numbers but i think the uh, you know one to five percent of the materials either gets damaged or cannot be found or get stolen because you don't have control over that material storage and logistics yeah. so it is an important problem now what at least i have experienced you know i visited that site site three times is that over here there is no natural flow right so let's say you need some customized steel plates for each different work stream even though the work looks the same you know the steel plates that you need are slightly different right so over here how do you coordinate the flow of the right material to the right work stream at the right time versus over here right so this this is much just my screen is not visible okay <laughs> we can add that afterwards that's uh, yeah i assume i assume you're comparing those two modes of operation yeah there. yeah that is what i am yeah. Yeah. right mm -hmm. so if we have different kind of steel plate just slightly different for the three different zones required getting the right material to the right place at the right time is important right but over here where do you all you know at what you will need is at least hey we have one yeah. central warehouse where all the material comes in and then it gets distributed to the individual places as needed versus over here if you are working in this focus and finish manner you can actually deliver the materials to exactly where it is needed right and the confusion is less about what goes where and your supplier is synchronized in the sense that they know that they have got to produce this bunch of steel plates first and this bunch of steel plates second and this bunch of steel plates third so i think this whole logistics issue is not unimportant i think it's very important in construction projects on site mm. i think that focus and finish allows for better logistics also yeah it it seems to allow you to get a person's mind around the overall project whereas if yeah. you've got 10 or 100,000 tasks it's just chaos it's a yeah. haystack isn't it plus plus over here you need much more a bigger footprint because you have all the work going on at the same time yeah right over here the storage space the footprint you need is hopefully going to be much less anything okay. you want to say to finish off sanjeev no i think thank you for this opportunity as i said you know we think it is time to change the world of projects i think projects can be done much faster and i think we ought to do them faster mm. and thanks for giving us this opportunity to spread the message to your students and uh, uh, you know anyone wants to write to me directly they can do that or if they want to channel through you, you know, more than happy to share whatever uh, experience we have now that's fantastic and i appreciate you uh both putting the thinking in and coming to share with our students uh because as as we've discussed and our own students on our particular program know the 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 way that the work of a project and its flow is managed is we believe an untapped opportunity for project improvement that uh, yeah very few people seem to be looking at. So thank you very much for leading the way then, Sandy.